Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the webinar. Uh, today, we are very pleased to have Vladimir Temliako from University of South Carolina, and he's speaking on sampling discretization of integral norms. Vladimir? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry for uh, inviting me uh, to this webinar. Uh, so my uh, talk will be uh, mostly like uh, very recent results. Uh, and. Uh, Uh, very recent result, and uh, the discretization by itself is a very uh, interesting, I would say, and very uh, important topic. Uh, but for some reason, uh, only fragmentary results uh, were known uh, till I would say very recent time. So what we are doing, we are doing kind of systematic study of these problems. So I will concentrate on just one direction. So let me just uh, set it up uh, right away. Uh, so sampling discretization, this is what we will be doing uh, by discretizing functions or by using uh, function, uh, the only information which you will use uh, of this function is the function values at some discrete points. So this is the whole point. So there are two uh, different settings, uh, but we will study only one of these. Uh, so one uh, setting is like this, when the functions uh, belong to n-dimensional subspace Xn. So this is our restriction. Certainly we will uh, is something about this n-dimensional subspaces, but at this point, just this. So this is n-dimensional subspace. This is one setting. Uh, and another setting is that uh, the, our functions belong to a given function class. So this is a typical, uh, say classical approach in approximation theory. Uh, when function class, for instance, a class of functions which have some uh, smoothness, like for instance, uh, bounded derivative or bounded mixed derivative in, multi in the multivariate case. And usually uh, these classes uh, are sets in an infinitely dimensional space. So these two settings, uh, they have, have fundamental uh, differences uh, between them. So we will concentrate only on the first one. So we call this the two names now are popular, a sampling discretization, what is in the title and which I already mentioned, and another, is, another one is Marcinkiewicz type discretization theory. Marcinkiewicz, because the first result of this type uh, was proved by Marcinkiewicz, and that was a result uh, about discretization of trigonometric polynomials, univariate trigonometric polynomials. I will mention at some point later. So, and there are different settings and different ingredients, uh, but we all concentrate on what I said, because discretization could be understood in a very uh, wide, uh, way. Uh, so this is what I already said. Uh, but as to uh, application, as to motivation from that side, uh, let me just give a little uh, very brief uh, uh, explanation of that. Uh, so uh, if you look, for instance, at PDEs and some other problems, uh, there is Galorkin method, uh, which is uh, classical and which is known very well. Uh, so we, what we do, we assume uh, that our solution comes from a finite dimensional subspace. And then we solve the problem, like for instance, P's for functions from that uh, linear subspace. Uh, but again, it's kind of analytical assumption, but if you want to do this computational, uh, then we need discretization. Uh, and again, very uh, natural and very classical way to discretize is to use the points. So people needed this a lot and people did, but what uh, was basically the general approach before that you have your particular uh, sub subspace, like for instance, in case of Marcinkiewicz, that was the subspace of trigonometric polynomials, and he solved the problem for that. Uh, you have algebraic polynomials, you solve this for that, and some other examples. Now, but we will try to look at this from a more uh, general point of view. And I think this will be closer to uh, functional analysis period. So let's proceed to uh, uh, the formulation of the problem. So what is that problem? So suppose that uh, omega uh, compact subset is just for convenience. Uh, it's not necessarily compact, but anyway, it's compact subset of Rg. Uh, and there is a probability measure mu on this uh, compact set. So, and then we say that uh, this subspace Xn, uh, the subspace of LQ with measure mu on here, uh, admits the martin cage type discretization theory. Uh, with the following parameters. And the very important parameter here is M. 
M is the parameter which we will uh, look carefully. Uh, parameter Q refers to the LQ space and with two constants. So if uh, this is what we say that Martin Cage type uh, theorem holds, uh, if we have the following property that there exists a set of M points such that the discrete LQ norm or uh, the Q exponent of this norm is equivalent uh, to the real LQ norm of element M. So basically, this is the problem. In other words, what we want to do, we want to replace uh, a given probability measure mu by a discrete measure, but with equal weights at each point uh, xi nu. So this is the definition. So now we want to replace the LQ norm by a discrete LQ norm with equal weights one over n. So in L infinity, we will not discuss this L infinity case uh, much, but anyway, just in L infinity case, similar setting, uh, but here the S to constant C2, it's clearly one because this inequality holds for all points, uh, but we want to have the lower bound for this discrete norm in terms of uh, L infinity. But L infinity, as I said, I will not pay much attention to this, uh, but I want to stress that at this point that it turns out uh, that this setting of the results for the discretization in Martzenkiewicz sense uh, for L infinity are very different from the results for, for LQ when Q is strictly less than infinity. So this is kind of special case, uh, but I will not uh, talk about this too much. So this is the notation which we will be using for that. So Xn belongs to this. Uh, so clearly as to the C1, C2, uh, if you allow the C1 and C2 to depend on X uh, or Xn, uh, then it kind of a trivial thing. We always can I mean, normal equivalent. So clearly you can find a dimensional subspace. But the whole point is that we would like to have these constants either to be absolute constant or something uh, which may depend on Q, but does not depend on this Xn. So an Xn, actually it will be not just one subspace, but it will be a sequence with N uh, going to infinity. And in that case, we would like C1 and C2 do not depend on that N. So you will see this later in the formulation. So to example, uh, I already mentioned trigonometric polynomials. So these are trigonometric polynomials of degree N. Uh, and it is well known uh, that uh, in case of L2, so let's start with this. This is the, the best started case, uh, L2, uh, that we can write this identity. So if you take the point, equidistant points uh, on, on, the, uh, on the period, uh, then the L2 norm is exactly uh, equal to this. So the number of points is 2n plus 1, and this is the formula. In this case, the constants C1 and C2 are 1s. So this is well-known result. And in terms of that uh, uh, notations, which I uh, just introduced, we can write this in this way. So the trigonometric polynomial, this subspace belongs to uh, this class. So uh, uh, let's continue to discuss uh, L2. So the first result, uh, I would say very non-trivial result, deep result and seminal result by Mark Rudelson uh, was in 1999, uh, where he proved the following result. Uh, he proved that result not in terms of uh, discretization, like I formulate that result, uh, but these are equivalent. And even at that time, it was known that these things are equivalent. Uh, that was about uh, orthogonal matrices and their submatrices. So, but uh, now, uh, omega m, uh, uh, our set which functions are defined, is a discrete set. So it consists of m points, but as you will see later, nothing will depend on this m. So, but this is still, it is a discrete set. Uh, and the probability measure is this, a special one, one over M at each point. So now assumption uh, that first of all, he considered only a real case and uh, this system is orthonormal on this omega M. So basically the subspaces uh, will be described by the orthonormal basis. So this is kind of natural when we are in L2. So we will keep doing that. And uh, it turns out that in order to prove uh, his non-trivial result, he needed this condition. We call this condition E, but again, this kind of a tradition because now in many papers, it 
uh, was used this condition E, but this is a condition. So the sum of uh, uh, the squares of this function, we can write absolute value, but functions are real, so it doesn't matter. So at each point for all this J, uh, we have this bound. We have this bound. So there is some constant T and we have this bound. Uh, so for those who are familiar with discretization and other stuff, uh, basically the function which is written here, uh, this is a Christoffel function. Now, but we will not be using this terminology, just this, this condition. Uh, this condition is equivalent to another one I will mention later, but anyway, so this is the condition. For instance, if our functions are uniformly bounded, uh, that this condition is satisfied. So if they're bounded by T in absolute value, then this is satisfied. So, but anyway, this is the condition E. It is important and this will play important role in uh, our results. So then uh, Rudelson proved uh, that uh, we have the following discretization. So then we want to discretize functions like this. And he claims that there is a set of these points, of these points, this J, with cardinality like this. So I uh, uh, attract your attention. You can forget about this epsilon uh, because this will be not an important stuff. It's formulated in that way, but for us, it will not be important. So you can take epsilon equals one half. So then it is of order n log n, n log n. And we have the discretization formula, uh, what I was talking about. This constant C1, if epsilon is one half, this is one half here and three halves here. So absolute constants, and you have a discrete norm equivalent to uh, the real L2 norm. But here is n log n. Uh, one remark, what is absolutely obvious, but let me uh, say this, that in order to uh, have inequality like this, any kind of discretization, that means the lower bound mostly, uh, that the number of points, that means M should be greater or equal than N. It's for sure, because if M is less than N, we can find an element uh, in the subspace, which is zero at all the points. So then clearly we uh, cannot talk about uh, this discretization. So this is a uh, lower bound. So M cannot be uh, better in a sense of order than N. So this upper bound gives us N log N. So we lose a little bit log N, but still we are, we are losing. So then uh, it could go in different directions. So the first step, now, and by the way, the technique uh, which uh, Mark Rudelson used uh, was a very uh, involved technique. Uh, he based uh, his proof on a very recent at that time result by Telegram and majorizing measures and all this stuff. So that was very involved. Uh, but later on, uh, th this is what uh, I observed uh, that this could be extended to arbitrary uh, omega. Now, but the point here, not in uh, extending to arbitrary omega, uh, but basically to use uh, a different technique. So the proof of this theorem uh, was used on a recently developed technique uh, in. Uh, random matrices. So we use these results from random, random matrices and I will, will explain you a little later why matrices are so important here. So, and you can get similar results. <clears throat> a little technical improvement here that is if you pay attention to epsilon, that there is no uh, uh, epsilon here log n divided by epsilon. It's still epsilon square here, but not under log, but it's a minor thing. But anyway, that, that was some step. But what is more interesting, and this is, that was kind of a breakthrough, but not basically in this my paper, I just used some breakthrough results and I will explain this in a minute, but let's look at this result. The setting is like in Rudelson's result. So discrete set and the same weights uh, and the functions are real. And uh, now it's real or complex, but it is not that important on this uh, omega M. But now instead of condition E, uh, we impose a strict, um, seriously uh, more uh, restricting condition like this. So we want the sums, I mean, basically that Christoffel function to be constant. So it is a constant, it is clear that it should be n because these functions are uh, uh, normalized, it's orthonormal. So if you integrate or sum this up, so we will we'll get uh, n. So this is clear that it should be n, but the point is that this is a constant. This is a constant. <clears throat> so, and the claim is, and then we can do this discretization, but what is very important, but the number of points 
for this discretization. The upper bound is n multiplied by the constant. So this is the best possible, this is the best possible uh, in the sense of order, uh, upper bound for this n. So the lower bound is greater or equal than n and the upper bound is that. So it is uh, discrete. So this is kind of a restriction, but not that important, but the more important restriction is this. Certainly uh, one can use the theorem and this is what I did. And this is why I was interested in that theorem uh, that you can use the theorem and prove good results for this L2 discretization for trigonometric polynomials because we have this property there. So, but anyway, so this is the first probably uh, result uh, when we get rid of that extra log. Uh, and in many cases, we have some results with these logs uh, and you will see this later, but we cannot uh, get rid of those logs. Uh, but what are, are the roots for that result? Because this is by nature, it's kind of a difficult result, but because it, it is uh, based on very deep results um, in other problems. Let me uh, proceed to that. <clears throat> so that was a lemma, which was directly used in that proof. And after using this lemma, the proof is rather simple. It's about like half a page, most a page. So, and this lemma is related to the results on Cadison zinger uh, problem. I will mention this on the next slide, but let's first look at this lemma. And that Cadison zinger problem in a Weaver form in, in, in his uh, reformulation. So let's have a system of vectors, m vectors again, but a lot of vectors, m could be really big uh, and all of them in this CN and have the following property. One property is this. So in other words, we can say that it is a tight frame. So all these CJs is a tight frame, no, but you don't need the terminology, just this condition that we can sum this up and get the, uh, for any W, for any W. Another condition, and this is very important, very serious condition here, uh, that these, these norms are the same, all the same. So basically this condition uh, is a previous slide is basically, this is why we have this condition, this is why. Uh, and then if you have this property, then we can do the following. And this is the claim. Then there is a subset so in the sense of discretization, in that case, we also uh, choose the subset of this. And here also we choose the subset, but with the property like this. It's not that obvious when you look at this, that these things, discretization and there and discretization is here are the same, but actually this is the same. This is the same. And then we have this condition. We have this condition. So this lemma, which was proved by Nitsa, Nalevsky and Ulanovsky, uh, and they derive, and they write this explicitly, and that they derive this from the following fundamental result, which is the result by Marcus Fillman and Srivastava, which solved the Kedison Zinger problem. Uh, what they proved, there are a different formulation of that, but what they proved is the same. So uh, we have the vectors, this is what we get. We have a tight frame, but here we have a condition like this, uh, inequality, lesser regular than epsilon. Uh, so this is a weak condition, but then the claim, the claim is that uh, if so, uh, then we can split the whole set of indices into two sets, S1 and S2 with this property. So when we write the property like this for both of these, for S1 and S2, then it is clear that we have for each of them uh, two-sided inequalities because <clears throat> we have this. So if you have for S2 like this and for S1, we have greater or equal than this one minus this one. And epsilon is small. So this is roughly speaking one half, one half. So it is a very difficult and it is fundamental uh, result. And that lemma, which I already mentioned, this was uh, derived from here. So now let's proceed further. Uh, and it turns out, and this is a very recent result with uh, Irina Limonova. Uh, she is a graduate student now in Moscow State University. Uh, so what we clearly wanted to do, we wanted to get rid in that uh, my previous theorem, uh, we wanted to get rid of uh, this one. So we wanted to replace this by condition E. And basically this theorem does that. So look at this, I mean, again, 
this is the system or the normal real or complex doesn't matter and uh, one generalization here is also that omega now is uh, any compact set in rg not necessarily uh, the finite set of points and if if this satisfies condition e just condition e not that more strict condition then we have discretization and the m satisfies this condition. So linear in N, that means this is uh, optimal in the sense of order uh, restriction on N. And we have this discretization. So this in a sense uh, is, is uh, the strongest theorem in discretization now, because this is general under this condition E, but we don't know, uh, honestly, we don't know if this condition E is needed or not. So it's a big open question. If you can get rid of this condition at all, for the result like that to hold, or we can uh, replace this by something weaker and so on and so on. So this is, this is not known, this is not known. I will make a comment on this in a little different way. And uh, basically that result was based on, an, on a version of uh, the result of Nitsa, Nalevsky and Ulanovsky and the lemma like this. So let's look at this lemma because again, there's a little difference. Still, we assume that it is a tight frame uh, but instead of uh, uh, normalization of all these uh, vectors uh, vj to be equal to one and the same number, uh, now we have just an equality. So, and actually this is what helps us to get uh, the condition E instead of that strict condition. And then we have this uh, discretization. We have this discretization. Uh, and as I said, so, uh, this in this case uh, the formulas for our discretizations uh, they all were of this form uh, with the same weight one over m and the question the natural question is because like for instance in uh, the cubature formulas and then other stuff uh, we can write other weights here and try to get the result uh, of equivalent uh, norms uh, in that setting and more general setting so I now formulate this uh, Marcinkiewicz problem with weights. Uh, so basically this is that same problem. And the only uh, relaxation of that problem is in this. So instead of uh, looking just for points, we allow ourselves to choose not only points, but also weights. So, and weights come here. So instead of one over M, we write this. So clearly if you can solve the Marcinkiewicz problem without weights, so then we can uh, solve this with weights. So it is, a, it is a weaker problem. But it turns out that <clears throat> relaxing problem, this problem just a little bit with these lambdas, we change the picture dramatically. So the results, are, the results here are stronger, in a sense, uh, much stronger. So annotations are similar, but we put W to emphasize that this is with weights. Some comments before I formulate the results, some comments. And these comments actually applies to both settings, that one and this one. But now let's look at uh, something which kind of a sound. Uh, so we are talking about subspaces. So everything is still in L2. So Xn is a subspace. And we have N uh, orthonormal functions. So an Xn is this space. Then what we do, we consider the matrix for each point X. So for each point X, we associate a matrix of this type. Uh, and let's see, say that this is a real uh, system. Uh, UI is a real system. And this is why we look at it. In complex, you just take uh, uh, complex conjugate here. But this is just for illustration. So let's consider just real case. Uh, so. This matrix is symmetric, it's uh, obvious, uh, almost obvious that it is positive semi-definite and also obvious that it is of rank one. So these are the properties of this matrix. And clearly it has special form, but uh, just these properties. And also it is easy to see uh, that for any F of this form, and remember that this system UI is uh, orthonormal, uh, we have this representation. So this is exactly what we are interested in. We want to discretize to estimate this L2 norm by the sum like this. So, and it turns out that this is exactly this. So let's look at this. So this is the bilinear form. 
And the matrix which provides this bilinear form is the linear combination of matrices of this form, an M of them, and minus identity matrix. So, and we are interested in bounding, I mean, making an absolute value of this. So this number, uh, but it is clear that it is bounded above by the largest eigenvalue of this matrix, which is in the parentheses. So this makes a connection uh, between uh, discretization, the error of discretization, and the problem of approximating the identity matrix by M term combination of matrices from that uh, system or that dictionary, which we described here. So these two problems are closely related here, it is clear. But one of the side effects, let me just mention, but I will not talk about this too much. So the whole this space of matrices, uh, because the number of elements is n square, so it most n square. So certainly we can write identity matrix as a linear combination of this, we say actually not n square, it's like n multiplied by n minus one divided by two, but of the order n, it doesn't matter. So in that sense, we, we can write this. Uh, but again, this is not something what uh, we are interested in because here is n square. You want to have uh, the minimal number for discretization. And here is the result. Here is the result, which was proved by uh, Batson, Spielman, and Srivastava. Uh, so again, two the same authors because the technique, by the way, which was used here in the proof of this theorem, and then later in that uh, paper by Marcus Spiel Spielman and Srivastava is uh, somewhat similar. So that one in Marcus Spielman Srivastava, it is an extension of this technique. And the te te technique is really kind of uh, difficult and, and deep technique. So, and here is the result. Let's look at this result. So now we have again a discrete set and the same weights, and this is a real orthonormal system. So this is everything like we had before, but no condition E, no condition E, without any conditions on this, uh, on, on these functions or on these vectors, if you wish, uh, they claim that there exists number B. Again, for any of these number B, uh, we can find a set for discretization and the weights uh, in the number, which is our number M, close to BN or is close to N, uh, such that we have discretization like this. And again, this constant one is here, and this constant, if B goes to one, is also goes to one. So this, uh, this uh, is a very kind of impressive uh, result. Uh, and let me make a comment how this result uh, was proved. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, when B goes to infinity, this goes to one. So if you want to have epsilon, like remember we have there, if you want to have epsilon, then we can get that epsilon from this formula. Just making B of order one over epsilon square like we had there, and we will get this result here. So when B goes to infinity, we can get this constant, this one and this one close. So, but uh, what was the technique? As I already explained, uh, uh, we want to approximate uh, identity matrix uh, by a linear combination of M term linear combination of function or of matrices like that. And this should be done in a spectral norm. So just a command that uh, is to approximation like this, we have an element in a Banach space and we have a dictionary in that Banach space and you want to approximate uh, by M term elements from the dictionary. This theory is rather well uh, developed. Uh, but in this particular case, when the norm is a spectral norm, now it, I mean, that general theory cannot be applied. We can do something, but in that case, we will get uh, rather rough results. But what they did, they analyzed uh, how the minimal and the maximum uh, eigenvalues of the matrix, identity matrix change when they add a matrix of rank one uh, of this type. If run, rank is one, then they can do that. And that is kind of complicated. Uh, I mean, they needed to control three iterative sequences at once. So, but anyway, so they did that and they proved that result. 
Now for the results. Uh, that means about this general omega. Again, it's kind of uh, not that difficult uh, generalization, but anyway, just to make uh, this uh, presentation uh, more complete, I will make some remarks. Uh, so my colleagues, uh, Feng Dai, Andrei Primak, uh, and Sergei Tikhonov, and later, a little later, Alexei Shadrin, uh, we started to work on those problems. Uh, and we extended that result on the condition that X ends from here. Uh, but later on, <clears throat> uh, we uh, proved that even that condition can be dropped. Uh, but the result was like this. The result was, was, uh, was like this. Uh, so we have uh, this, this bound. We have this bound. Uh, that means for any and B is like this. So now we do not allow this B to go to infinity. So we cannot get this epsilon like in there. But it, it, actually, it's a minor thing in a sense. But uh, again, let me stress this. It's for any uh, X and, and now omega is any compact. So this is very general situation. Uh, but the only uh, kind of restriction here is that Xn is a real, uh, real subspace. Uh, because in that result by Batson, Spielman, and Srivastava, uh, everything was, was real. Uh, and we get this discretization. We get this discretization. So again, let me stress this. That no condition E, but uh, we uh, have weights lambda j here. Again, we don't know. Uh, at least at this point, there are no counter examples. So it may happen that in a setting like this, well, clearly with other constants here, we can replace all these lambda j's by one away. It's an open, uh, an open problem. Uh, and this is just a remark that uh, we can actually, uh, may, it's, it was interesting observation in our paper with uh, Irina uh, Limonova. Uh, that uh, we can make the complex version of that. Uh, and for that complex version, now we have two proofs, basically. One <clears throat> is on the base of uh, this uh, uh, one paper, one paper of uh, Batson, Spielman, and Srivastava, and this one, and another proof based on the paper by Marco Spielman and Srivastava. So now two, uh, two, two proofs for uh, this result. Now let's uh, proceed to the case uh, of uh, discretization in LQ. Uh, it is a much more uh, difficult case. Uh, and there is nothing uh, similar to the technique which was developed for L2. So we cannot reformulate this in terms of approximation of matrices in some norms and other stuff. So there should be different approaches. And there are different approaches. Uh, and uh, those approaches which we have now uh, uh, they are based uh, on entropy numbers. So I will introduce this in a minute, but let me just give sort of a general strategic way. So we have two types of theorems and basically two steps. One uh, kind of theorem is a conditional theorem. So we have our subspace Xn. We uh, assume that this subspace Xn has some properties which are formulated in terms of behavior of entropy numbers. This is one. And then if you have this, then we guarantee that there is a discretization theorem. And then the second step is if you have something about, if you know something about the subspaces, then we can prove that these subspaces have that behavior of entropy numbers, which we desire. So basically this two steps uh, strategy, but let's begin with entropy numbers. <clears throat> this is classical definition. So let me not, uh, read all of them, but just pay attention to the entropy numbers. Uh, and here, uh, k index k stay, stands here, but for two to the k points. So the different uh, notations, but let me uh, just uh, attract your attention to this. So epsilon k means that we have two to the k points in there. So now the conditional theorem. Uh, historically, that was first proved in L1. And using one kind of technique, which uh, was different, uh, we could not extend this to LQ and Q is greater than, than, than one. We invented another technique, but the, the, the formulation of result turned out to be the same. So let's look at this because this is kind of a <clears throat> typical one. So we have n-dimensional subspace. And we assume 
that it satisfies this condition. But what is that? Xn1, this is the unit ball. Uh, we could use different notations, but again, this now is kind of standard. So this is the unit ball of this uh, n-dimensional subspace and unit ball is in L1, in L1. So this is unit ball. And we assume uh, that uh, entropy numbers satisfy this condition, this decay. Why is that is clearly you can ask why should this, uh, but you will see later that uh, under very natural assumptions, we can prove exactly this kind of, this kind of uh, decay. Is to uh, this entropy numbers. Now, the, the important thing is this, the first line, because the second line is basically follows from this, the first line. Uh, because then it's very well known result. Maybe with a little different constant, but the important thing is this, the first line. So if we have this uh, condition on the entropy numbers, then we guarantee the following, this uh, discretization and with M of this order. <clears throat> Let's look at this. So parameter B, it's written here like as a constant, but B is allowed to depend on M. Uh, so in that sense, B is kind of independent parameter. B, but usually B grows like logarithmically with N. So if B grows logarithmically with N, then what we have here, that will be N, and this is log N, and here is log N square. So roughly N log N uh, cube. So still uh, logarithmic extra multiplier, extra factor, but uh, not that big, just logarithmic. And this is general, and this is in the one and this, but under this condition, under this condition. Let's go uh, further. So as I mentioned, then we have similar result. You will see that, that this is a similar result. Uh, however, the proof of this result is very different from the proof of the previous result. Uh, because in the previous result, we used like more or less classical chaining technique. Uh, and here, in, in addition to chaining technique, we use what we call sandwiching technique and other stuff. So this proof is more involved, but I will not comment on that because I don't have time for that. So, but again, if you have the condition like this, but Q stands here and one over Q stands here. <clears throat> if you have condition like that, then the result is similar. So N and B to the Q, there was N to the, to the one and this to the Q and this logarithmic term here, logarithmic square. And we have a uh, uh, discretization theorem like that. Now, let me comment uh, about a very, very recent result in that. So what is very important, let me stress on that that in both theorems, in the previous one and in that one, we are interested in, uh, in the behavior of entropy numbers. The unit ball is in LQ, uh, but we are interested in the behavior in L infinity. So first of all, it is clear that this, uh, this ball should be embedded in L infinity, otherwise it would be infinity, but this kind of minor, but anyway, we need the behavior in L infinity. But it turned out that for the purposes of discretization, uh, we uh, might be satisfied with something a little bit weaker than uh, L infinity norm in those entropy numbers. And this was noticed by Igor Kosov very recently. His paper in archive appeared like a couple of months ago. And he is a member like uh, Irina is a graduate student and a member of that, my laboratory in, in, in Moscow and Kosov is also uh, he's not a graduate student, he is well advanced and, <clears throat> uh, mathematician, but he is a member of that uh, laboratory. What he observed that instead of an infinity norm, uh, we can consider a weaker norm, which is very popular in, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, stochastic processes, empirical processes, and stuff like that. So instead of L infinity, we consider this one. So we take a set of points of number s and we can see the maximum on those points only, uh, not uh, over the whole uh, domain omega, but only on those points. So clearly we have this inequality and uh, he proved the fallen, the fallen theory. Uh, so it's maybe a little bit uh, difficult to uh, look at all these numbers here, but I will explain. So the most important, important thing that uh, we still have the same discretization uh, and the condition instead of L infinity norm here, we have an infinity norm, but for points like this, and we need to control the number of these points. 
So, and these kind of two things are, are going together. So for M, this is the restriction. And then for any subset of M points, if M is like that, we have this inequality. So this inequality, as I mentioned, this is just uh, the same one uh, is the whole thing, but this is the same, the same thing as here. The first line of this, this is the first line <clears throat> of this. Uh, so the condition on the uh, entropy numbers is weaker because of this. Instead of an infinity, we have an infinity of this. Certainly one can say that maybe to bound these entropy numbers in that generality for arbitrary YM could be as difficult problem as L infinity, but it turns out no. We have, in some cases, we have uh, good general results for this, but not for L infinity. So anyway, if this is satisfied, then we get this discretization for M of this order. And this W here uh, uh, looks as follows. Let me, let me show this and compare. So at one, this is two, but it's not that, that uh, important now. So when Q is uh, between one and two, see the maximum Q and two, I mean, maximum is two, this again, it's, it's one. <clears throat> so when Q less than two, this clearly, this W is bounded. But when Q goes to infinity, this W increases. So that means uh, this term with Q going to infinity, this logarithmic term increases. So, and this is a difference, an important difference uh, with this bound, because this bound is for all Q. Uh, and this extra log here, extra log here does not depend on Q, but the restriction is stronger because the restriction in L infinity. So here, we, in a sense, we uh, weaken uh, this, uh, but we get uh, worse results for this in, the, in this WQ. So now, now this is the next stage what I said that under what conditions we, we get the, the, that uh, entropy numbers uh, behavior. So one of the results for Q between one and two, this is better understood. So if you have this inequality, which is called Nikolsky type inequality, between L infinity and L2, and this N uh, square root of N here. So this is a classical form. And in addition, this one, it's more like technical, but still we need it. And without this condition, that result is not correct, but it's more like technical that the L infinity norm can be bounded by this norm. For instance, if you are in <clears throat> L little uh, N, uh, then this is, this is the case. But anyway, so under these conditions, and this theorem says that, so if those two conditions are satisfied, then for this Q, we guarantee uh, that entropy numbers in L infinity decay in exactly that way as we wish. So N over K, one over Q, and this extra log, so this is our B. So all this term is our B, and which is of log N to one over Q uh, form. So that means if you use this, as you can see, this one over, key, one over Q, and this is the term which is required in that uh, theorem, one over Q. And then B, remember that log N to one over, one over Q. So when we raise this to the exponent Q, we get log N, that's log N, and this square, so we get log N Q. So this, in, in that sense, uh, this, is a, this is a good result. But we don't know if you can uh, uh, improve this to uh, like we had in case Q equals two, we don't need any logs. And this is what we know uh, from uh, uh, our result uh, because this condition, <clears throat> this Nikolsky condition is exactly condition E. So let me, I will not go into too much details about this but these two conditions are equivalent. So Nikolsky condition for the subspace uh, and uh, condition E for the basis, orthonormal basis of that subspace, these are the same conditions, exactly the same. So in that sense, uh, in case Q equals two, we have a stronger result, uh, but we don't know if we can uh, get rid of Q uh, when Q is less than two. In Q greater than two, the situation is in a sense even more uh, difficult uh, so one of the results, and this is what, what, what Kosov proved. So see, now we still have a kind of Nikolsky inequality, 
because uh, instead of L2, we have Q here and this parameter here, extra factor here, instead of writing this explicitly in terms of N, we just write M. So clearly this M has nothing to do with the number of points of the previous, like Rudolfson's result. This is just a parameter. So with some constant M and the claim is that if you hit this Nikolsky inequality, then this entropy numbers decay like this. So again, in the, exactly that way as we would like uh, one over K to one over Q. So that means that form of a decay of entropy numbers is very natural for settings like that. So as a result, clearly, and then uh, we, can, uh, we can claim uh, that under this Nikolsky inequality, we have a discret discretization result. So, and uh, another result uh, which connects basically uh, the Nikolsky inequality and a stronger result in L infinity norm uh, is the following result. It's just a kind of a remark, it's very simple uh, corollary of this uh, <clears throat> result by uh, Kosov that if in addition to Nikolsky inequality, we assume that there is a discretization, L infinity discretization. As with the number of points, it could be huge, uh, but important and it is just polynomial in N, not exponential in N, but polynomial in N. So if you have that, uh, then you have similar to this one bound, but this bound for entropy numbers is in, in L and P. So what I think I have just one or two minutes left, right? Sorry. Uh, and as to uh, all the theoretical results, I'm more or less done. So I can give some examples about trigonometric polynomials, uh, but uh, up to you, because if there's just one or two minutes, maybe it's a natural point to stop and have a discussion. Yeah, I mean, you, you can use a couple more minutes. Yeah, like three, four minutes. Okay, then let me just uh, basically browse through this. So. One of the examples, like trigonometric polynomials. Uh, as to L2, I already mentioned uh, that in that case, everything is clear. Uh, I mean, even from that, those results are clear that just for three years clear before it was not that, that clear. Uh, but let me skip this. This is uh, the result which is uh, classical. So we can discretize uh, trigonometric polynomials with frequencies in parallel pipettes in all uh, LQ and uh, in ideal situation when the number of points uh, is a bounded dimension. So that is classical result. Let me just uh, go through. But very interesting from the point of application is the following setting. Uh, when the set of trigonometric polynomials uh, is the set of those which have frequencies is what is called hyperbolic cross. So it's written here, the whole definition is written here and look at this. So uh, these are the points, see these are uh, the uh, re uh, rectangles or parallel pipettes of the roughly speaking of the volume two to the n, this row s, the biggest one. And then we combine all of them. So it's like a hyperbolic cross. For these ones, <clears throat> let me not go through all that stuff. For these ones, we do not have the final results. I mean, we have some improvements uh, and uh, it is proved, uh, what is also interesting here, that it is proved that in all cases, when Q from one to infinity, we have the discretization results like, like it is written here uh, in all this LQ. And for M, which are of the cardinality of this, uh, of the dimension of this space, the cardinality of the uh, set of uh, frequencies and multiplied by N, which is logarithmic to this, to some exponent. And this exponent is explained here, but anyway, so this is, this is, this is the result. This is the result. And the important point is again, this kind of <clears throat> historical remark, uh, there's this new technique that allows, I mean, general technique, uh, which we proved for general subspaces. Uh, applying this to hyperbolic crosses, we can improve uh, the previous results, which uh, were known uh, from 1999 uh, due to uh, Eduard Bilinski. And then, okay, let me then stop. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, beautiful talk. Uh, 
Uh, we can open for questions and comments now. Any questions? So, so I have a comment on that um, condition E. Mm -hmm. um, so first, that was, that was an excellent talk. It was very interesting. Um, I think condition E is equivalent to being able to do a change of measure on omega so that, so that, or so being able to discretize, I think is equivalent to condition E being satisfied if you change a measure on omega and put a different probability measure on it. We're yeah, this is, this, this is a very good point. Uh, I did not go into the details of those proofs, uh, but indeed this technique uh, of uh, change of measure uh, it goes back to like uh, Schechtman, Gideon Schechtman, and uh, then it is in the in, in the paper, uh, this uh, classical paper uh, of uh, Burgian, Linden Strauss, uh, uh, and uh, Vitaly Milman. Uh, so they use this technique and it's in the following way. So, uh, and this is basically the step from uh, weights one over M to the general weights. Uh, because change in the measure, we can uh, gain uh, in a new measure, we can gain the Nikolsky type inequality. Mm -hmm. And then we apply that uh, technique for one of them and we get uh, this, this lambda. Yeah, this is a very, yeah, this is very, it is uh, related uh, somehow to the, those results which uh, are known in Banach spaces very well. Uh, that uh, when the general problem is we have an arbitrary subspace. And now you are asking uh, what should be the dimension of that at little uh, p space in order to uh, embed this your arbitrary given uh, subspace, a subspace and to, to embed this uh, into that LN uh, like using the sort of isomorphism. Could you do this and how big uh, that uh, dimension should be? And this is still not solved problem. In some cases they have <clears throat> similar to what we have uh, with uh, log uh, n's, extra log n factor, uh, but this is a different problem. For q greater than two, they have a different uh, behavior there. Uh, but we do not uh, yet know how deep uh, these connections are yet. Uh, but but this, this, this is connected. And that uh, what you mentioned this change of measure, this is classical uh, met it in, in that area too. Thanks. Thank you. Any others? So maybe the related question for P greater. Question. Than, uh, go ahead. Okay, Michael. Uh, you indicated at the beginning that the fact you were talking about a complex subset of RD was not crucial. It was just about convenience. Uh, how, 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 simple, how much can you reduce uh, this? Uh, there doesn't seem to be any dependence on D. Would it be reasonable to say that, it, that the, the, it would be equivalent to consider your compact set to be the unit interval and, and D equals one, or there is some subtlety which arises? And again, would it be equivalent to assume that your, your, your compact subset is a unit interval D equals one and all the elements of the function, are, all the elements of the space are continuous, or is there some subtle thing which arise here. You know what, uh, there are two things here, two things go together. Uh, not only omega, but also the measure on that omega. Uh, so in this setting, uh, that clearly if this uh, omega uh, is uh, even like when it is omega is kind of uh, complicated, uh, but combined with mu, uh, so my feeling is that in many cases, uh, we can uh, reduce this to another measure and to the just uh, unit interval, like you said, but it will be another measure. Uh, so when we are talking about, when we are talking about uh, this arbitrary weights, uh, then probably these two things are equivalent. But when we are talking about this uh, weights one over M, uh, then it makes a difference uh, because then when we are changing from one 
omega to another omega, we make a change of variables and then this, this changes the measure and changes the weights in there. So this could be uh, could be a difference in there. But as to, uh, as to compactness, as I, as I mentioned, uh, certainly when we are playing with continuous functions, uh, this is uh, certainly an issue because uh, if omega, for instance, is not bounded, not bounded, that just being the continuous, so even if bounded, but not closed, not, not a compact, uh, then if you consider a continuous function, uh, then uh, it does not guarantee that it is bounded. So that means we need to do that. We need to say something. So the easiest way uh, to avoid all this kind of headache is to assume that it is compact. Uh, but uh, as a matter of uh, as a matter of sense, uh, I don't think anybody yet at this point paid too much attention to the structure of this omega. So basically, as you see here, this first it was very simple. It's just discrete. Uh, then what we did, we said that oh now we can we can make further steps uh, to like this like compact, uh, but it might it it, it might happen that uh, we kind of uh, oversee something that maybe some structure of this omega will eventually play some role, but we haven't encountered with these kind of features yet. Thank you. Right. You're Thank welcome. You. So. Um... I, I was going to ask about, so when you have this finite dimensional subspace of capital LP and, and you have this estimates for the discretization, does the Euclidean distance of the subspace comes into the picture? What, say the, 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 like the, the last the, sentence. The Euclidean distance of the subspace X, like the, how the fundamental distance between X and L2, uh, does it, affects the, I mean, it should come into the picture somehow, right, for, for estimating uh, the number of points in the discretization. Do you understand the question? But, uh... I mean, you have a sub finite dimensional subspace of capital LP, right? And then you have this estimate on it, depending on Q and everything else. But how about the distance of the subspace to, to little L2 of corresponding dimension? Like, the, because if it already lived in L2, then, then you have probably a different estimate. So. But see, this is uh, uh, the, the point here is maybe I, I, uh, I'm not answering your question, but uh, uh, what I understood from your question is the following that uh, indeed uh, in that theory, what I just mentioned is uh, uh, what I mentioned, like uh, Gideon Schechnant was working on that. Uh, but we try to embed a given subspace into L little, like for instance, in our case, L2 and with bigger dimension to have that isomorphism. But if we ask only about that, uh, then we have our hands free to discretize in a way we would like. And for that reason, L2 in that setting is a trivial problem because we take uh, orthonormal basins and we discretize using Fourier coefficients. And in that case, discretization works with uh, exactly this new n is equal to the dimension. So we do not lose anything. But if we like in my case, if we impose this extra restriction that uh, the discretization should be uh, sampling discretization or Martzenkiewicz style discretization, this brings problems. So this is the whole point. Okay, uh, any others? Thanks so much. So um, one thing that, that I was interested in is, is uh, so you're using, always considering probability measures. Um, and so if you didn't take a probability measure, then you wouldn't have to divide by the number of points because the dividing by the number of points was to keep it uh, the uniform probability measure on the discrete sampling points. And so if you did that, then you could do this in for infinite dimensional spaces. And then, uh, so with, with, uh, with there and Spiegel, we, we proved that um, an infinite dimensional result of the nitzan olevsky ulanowski theorem. And, and so I think, I think in L2, it would work in infinite dimensions and I'd be really interested if it would work for any 
P other than two. Uh, <clears throat> I see, I see what you mean. Because in some cases when we are talking about uh, infinite uh, dimensional cases, but that was a little different. Uh, what I mentioned in the very beginning then function classes, uh, but we go around that problem in a little different way. Uh, but yeah, I, I see what you mean. Uh, and you mentioned that you have a, a paper on this topic? Yeah, yeah, we, we proved that you can discretize any uh, continuous frame. Uh -huh. and, and so it's like what um, Nitsan, Alevsky, Lunovsky proved for the Fourier transform, where they sampled that and got uh, a frame of exponentials. Uh, we proved that you could do that for any uh, bounded continuous frame. Uh, I see. I, I see. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and you clearly do also use that kind of uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Marcus uh, Spielman yes. uh, technique. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, that's that, I, that's I, fundamental. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I agree. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, we, we only have results in L2, though. And so your, your results for yeah, L2. Yeah, but this is uh, sure we are limited to that if you want to use yeah. uh, the Marcus Spielman Srivastava technique. I know more general like this matrices and other stuff. Yeah, it would be very interesting to understand if there is anything similar or anything uh, which can be extended mm -hmm. to LP. It's, I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The proof for L2 is so hard that it's it seems <laughs> that if it was true in LP, <laughs> it would be extremely difficult. Yeah, no, yeah, it is very specific. It uses uh, this uh, specific L2 structure, it's for sure. Yeah, but on the other hand, it, as you could see from this talk, uh, if you uh, sacrifice by these laws, mm -hmm. that we can, we can do something. And again, if you uh, go back to, for instance, like uh, Rudelson's result, uh, that was really, at that stage, it was really, really tough result. And still it was with that extra law. So. Are there analogous results for the Hardy spaces? Uh, I don't know. We did not do that, uh, but probably one can do something there too. Yeah, what we did with the, that was just this very, I would say, classical norms like LQ norms. Uh, but clearly, one can one can think about uh, because uh, let me make this a little bit in a little bit different way. Because this problem certainly is uh, really closely related to numerical integration. But usually when we talk about numerical integration, uh, we have like a function class or something and we integrate the function. Uh, but here we can say, let's integrate like for instance, absolute value F raised to exponent Q. And then it is, it is a numerical integration problem, but this is exactly our discretization problem. And certainly now we can say, okay, we are talking about some norm, like for instance, hard space norm, which is integral norm in a certain sense. Uh, then we can say, okay, let's try to replace that integral by appropriate cubature form. So this will be again, like a discretization problem. Sure, yeah, we can, we can try that. You expect a different set of techniques to resolve those issues in the hard space? Uh, I don't know. It's difficult to say because uh, this technique is sort of specific. Uh, one is specific for L2 and you don't know how to extend this to LQ. And the one which is uh, de was developed for L1 was specific for L1. We could not extend this to LQ. And now the one which we have for LQ is kind of also special. I don't know. Uh, it for sure, more or less for sure that uh, you will need to do something. It will not be like you just take this, uh, maybe some results of this, but the, most likely uh, you will need to do something for sure. But how uh, difficult or how deep you will need to go into the technique, I don't know. We did not try that. Okay, thank you so much for that, Demotava. That, yeah, that was awesome. Um, I ask another uh, question. Uh, sure. I ask another question. Go ahead, Michael. 
could you please go back a small number of pages to where you were looking at results for trigonometric polynomials of d variables and you had these uh, these annuli coefficients your your little bit back please do you mean this one uh, you have you 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 you're considering you're considering uh, uh, places where the where the uh, indices are, are, are contained in some kind of annulus in in RD. Uh, well, my question is very vague and perhaps very silly. I saw things there that made me think of uh, the uh, the theory of Sobolev spaces and Trebolezorkin spaces and so on, where where you use Fourier transforms. There's a there's a Michelin multiplier theorem in the background. There's there's Littlewood Paley theory in the in the background, and I just wonder if there's some interlap, inter overlap somehow, some kind of mutual uh, benefit from from this this rather diff There seems to be some. Uh, there we are. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, this very trivially and superficially makes one think of the way uh, Jacques Petri defined Sobolev spaces, uh, and then the Treble is Orkin spaces, and there's the in the background there's a Michelin multiplier theorem and. Uh, uh, so I'm just wondering if that really can in some way interact with what you've been doing here. Very vague question. Yeah, but you, you touch a very interesting direction. Let me just, again, uh, not going into too much details, uh, just describe this. So when we are talking about uh, uh, trigonometric polynomials, uh, then certainly this technique and the use of trigonometric polynomials uh, was exploited a lot for function classes. And here is the general picture. Uh, if you talk about uh, Sobolev classes, even anisotropic Sobolev classes, then in that case, you are satisfied with the trigonometric polynomials with frequencies uh, in uh, parallel pipes. So this is what I said from the point of view of discretization is kind of ideal because discretization can be done uh, with uh, the number of points of the same order as a dimension. And that was used a lot uh, in, for instance, reducing uh, the continuous problems, like for instance, for Kolmogorov, Weitzes, and so on, to discrete problems. And in discrete problems, it was solved, and then they moved back and got the results for this. So now, uh, and uh, the, 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 the results about the multipliers there and so on and so on. they are used for embeddings and so there's this the whole machinery. Uh, but there is another kind of classes uh, which are very important in applications now. These are classes with uh, mixed smoothness. For instance, this classes with bounded mixed derivative or some conditions on bounded uh, mixed differences and so on and so on. And it turns out uh, that trigonometric polynomials of this type with frequencies in hyperbolic crosses, they play similar role for these classes as those trigonometric polynomials with frequencies in parallel pipettes play the, in, the, in the case of anisotropic Sobolev classes. So, but unfortunately, these classes, uh, the hyperbolic crosses polynomials, are much more difficult to study from all points of view, not only from the point of view of discretization, but from all points of view, uh, then uh, those which are associated with parallel pipes. So in that sense, uh, this, this is very interesting, and, but it's still a very, very difficult problem. Yeah, but you are absolutely right that these things are like classes and trigonometric polynomials, if you are talking about periodic classes. These things are very closely connected. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. Thank you again.